Is everybody ready? We'll go on and get started then. Um, welcome. I'm Billy Kennedy. I'm uh, uh, County Commissioner from Watauga County. And uh, let's go around and do introductions real quick just so we can uh, refresh our brains here. Andrea Martin, Regulatory Compliance Manager. Uh, Annette LaForge, Regulatory Compliance Specialist. Marvin Sanders, I'm the Risk and Regulatory Affairs Director. Kate Lance, Quality Improvement Specialist. What's your first name? Kate. Kate, nice to meet you. Uh, Yvonne French, Division of Mental Health and ESBS. Jamie Duncan, um, I'm Reverend Pack. Jack Lane. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, well, um, I guess first. Do we know about having business? I don't know if Pat's going to make it here or not. I haven't heard anything. Yeah. I haven't heard. I did get an email from him with a letter that I didn't read. I saw it. Um, and then Dr. Hill. And I, okay. I don't know if he'll be here either. They haven't notified me. I don't know if they're going to We did change the time, so um, I hope they caught that. But mm -hmm. we're going to get started, I guess. Yeah, we, need to start with we do. Um, it's a significant amount of data y'all have given us today, so hopefully we can make, uh, make it through it. Um, I guess that first thing I need is an approval of the agenda for today. Uh, I'll make that. All in favor? Aye. And then uh, a review and approval of the April minutes. They were in our packet too. They were. Quite concise. Quite concise. <laughs> I move we approve the minutes. I'll second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, um, I, I used to be, I used to think I wanted more in the minutes, but now that I'm a public official, I like the succinct short minutes, <laughs> as long as it touches the important point. So. Well, good, I guess uh, um, we're going to start with you, Marvin. Uh, TCLI monthly report. Um, Which one are we going to start with? <laughs> Looks like 100 here. Let's see. So it's April TCI, TCI, I'll be going over April. The dashboard? <clears throat> the, that one, yes. Okay. So, we don't want any changes after that. Um, okay. But uh, uh, April, uh, you know, our data is always behind again. Just a reminder. Um, there's a way to put in your packet uh, it's March as well, since, uh, since we didn't need in March. So okay. Uh, I'll just so go over the, the April. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> For a while, they were putting the agenda item on the front page of the reports. I don't know when they stopped doing that. Okay, I've got to just set it flipped over backwards. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> That's okay. My bad. Mm, I'm here for you. <laughs> um, so, um, I'm on slide three now. Okay. And uh, as of April, and I haven't received uh, the data from May yet. Uh, I'm normally receiving around the 20, 20th, 21st, uh, but I haven't received it yet, so it's running late. Um, but as of April, uh, we have exceeded our uh, number of individuals transitioning into supportive housing uh, for the entire year. Uh, so I'm pretty pleased with that. Yes, that's a good accomplishment. That was a hard one to do. It was a hard one, and the state um, has already notified us that they will be raising our, oh, our target now. <laughs> 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 we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, the percent of individuals transitioned within 90 days uh, in April and March. Uh, we exceeded our target on those. Uh, the days from uh, housing slot issue to transition, Again, in April and March, we, uh, we exceeded the target there. Percent of individuals transitioning with tenancy support, we're still at 100% for the entire year, so uh, we're exceeding our, our targets there. For the... Um, <coughs> yes, sir. This, these are 10 month numbers. So, the, so there's, we're 10 months into the... 10 months in, but we've already exceeded the annual. Okay, right. Yeah. 
So we met the target even. This is not the annual. This is actually 10 times our target. So we met the target even. Yeah. 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 Right. But 12 times our target is also. <coughs> but that, the annual. But that's here. Right. It would be uh, about 75 or 70. It's actually 79. So 79. we've done 80. So okay. we've exceeded the annual yeah. and we've exceeded the, the target that you're looking at the, for the month. Not exactly what that showed. That's yeah. Okay. Um, for a number of individuals uh, newly served by the Delta IPS service, we had uh, 11 more individuals in uh, April, 17 more individuals uh, in March, and we're at 158. There's no target for this uh, measure. The number of at risk, um, we um, had six uh, in April, four in March. So in March we did not meet our target, but we're still above, uh, uh, well, we're almost above uh, where we needed to be. We're 5.7. Uh, target is six. <clears throat> target is six. So in reality, um, we are above that target now. We just have to see the data back in the state. So, so that's looking good. Um, the slide six, these all have measures. And for March and April, we were at 100% for the individuals uh, with the in con uh, contact. Uh, for the housing status, 90 days after the housing slot was issued, we were at 100% both the March and April. For the individuals uh, who agreed to transition, um, we had one in March and 12 in April. There's no measure for, there's no target for that. Um, for in-reach contracts, it was so like with, Without the target, are we just following this for our own data, or is this possibly a, a, a would it become a super measure with the, with the state set targets for I don't it? think that it will become a super measure, but we've been told that there will possibly be targets in the future. It does come out on the TCLI dashboard from the state. Um, and so they're following it, and we're following it. Hey, um, Pat. Sorry. Welcome, Matt. It's all right. We're glad you're here. We're just, we're just getting started. We haven't very much. So for uh, we're going over just a second. We're going over this uh, TCLI report. This the uh, for April. Over here. Sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Um, for NRH context, the result of the decision transition. March we were three and a half percent of all the contacts that we had, and then in April we were six point seven percent. Same thing as the previous. Uh, no, no target. And we're just um, following this paper. So, are those low numbers? I mean, those percentages seem to be jumping around a lot. Yep. Um, they're lower than what we would like them to be. Okay. And when we get to the slides comparing us to the LME, the other LMEs, some were higher than others were not. Mm -hmm. right. Quality of life surveys. Uh, this is the since we didn't meet last month, this is the first time that you have seen that we have actually met the target. So in March and April, uh, we were at 100%, which gives us the 80% average that we need for the year. And I, I saw, I think, in one of the quality improvement projects, that was one of them there, wasn't it? And uh, that really, really worked out. I guess, was it forcing the providers to do the surveys? I mean, I no, thought that was it was forcing us to do the surveys and it's forcing us to uh, keep track of it internally. Um, there is a significantly longer lag time for the quality of life surveys than there are for the other data. So internally we thought that we were doing better than we were, but then we would get the dashboard and it would show something else. So we just had to adjust what our expectations were. And, uh, and then found time before and after on the 30-day period. Was that one? Was that? Am I mixing up two different projects? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so on the on slide eight, I just want to point out that this is the first month that we have met that we have um, actually met all of the measures. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Usually we. I'm having 
Yeah. Real hard time following. It's We're the dashboard. Here. He's on slide A. It's the one that says the dashboard on it. Okay. Thank you. Just about so falling the, off the table. It's a TCLI. That one. Okay. So just flip it over. But yeah, those those eight measures, those are really good. I, I'm gonna I, I check that and I'm gonna report that to the board. So they'll, they'll be glad to hear that. Like I said, the first time that we've met all eight in a month, so we're really pleased about that. Well, it's it's nice to see the uh, corrective actions um, working. <laughs> so I've moved over to slide ten, and this is comparing us with the other. Uh, LMEMCOs. Let's see where uh, toward the top there. At 123%. And uh, the 123% is actually 123% of our real target. We've had this discussion before. Uh, on the dashboard, it says 6 per month, but our real target is 6.58. So, uh, our 123% is 23% of the 6.58. The other figures are based on whatever's on the dashboard because I don't know what their real numbers are. But we're still near the top, so we're right there. Yeah. Um, for 90 days after housing slot, um, we're sort of in second place there, one of the three people that are actually uh, exceeding the target in the state. Um, for uh, days from housing slot issue to transition, uh, we're at 88 percent, or 88, which uh, puts us second in the state. For individuals transitioning with Tennessee Support Services, uh, again, we are at the top of the state with partners, uh, so maintaining our 100 percent. For individuals new, newly served by Fidelity IPS providers, uh, we have a total of 158, uh, which puts us uh, in third in the state. For under at risk, we're at 95%. You can see that this is um, a problem area for most of the LME NCOs. Uh, Trillium seems to be the only one that's really figured this out. I think that when the numbers come in for May and for June, that we will um, be above the 100% mark. Um, so hopefully they, uh, the state will consider all of the individuals that we have sent uh, marked uh, at risk. And that's not a super measure, is it? You know, I want to say something about <clears> that. Some of y'all have seen it. Some of y'all sent it to, some of y'all didn't. I don't know how many of y'all ever read Mad in America, but it's. Uh, it's big nationally in the consumer survival world. And there's a client from North Carolina that wrote an article for Mad in America that came out this month. And it's all about this. But what y'all probably won't know is the client that wrote the article, she didn't want anything to do with this program at all. And I had a conversation with Christina Carter at a board meeting several months ago. And Christina's knows the person too and they're from a different part of the state and Christina said tell her to get in that program if she can to fight to get in that program and she got in this program and there are a lot of people going to be embarrassed by this article and probably already are and if you've not read it I suggest you read it because all this is great but this is just numbers and it really shows you and if it can happen to this person, it can happen to anybody, how easy it is. Because this is a well-connected person. It, it can happen to anybody ending up institutionalized for the rest of their life. So, Billy, I sent him a I, I saw it. I, I didn't get a chance to read it, but I, 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 if I find not read it. it. I hope I will some, read. you will. Somebody, y'all will find it and take the time to read it. I didn't send it to everybody. I sent it to Billy specifically because he's part of this committee. But, um, I will read it. Thanks. Since it, I feel like Christina's ultimately responsible because I went back to this person and I'm, I'm the unnamed person in the article that was on PAMI and, and on other things. And part of the other things was this committee and this board 
it's how I learned what I learned about PCLI. And this, program's li this person's living in the community again versus nobody was giving her a choice other than maybe a group home or an old folks home. But I hope y'all read it because it's, it's important. Do you know about TCLI, not IPS? I'm talking about the TCLI program. And Madden America. Mm -hmm. Forward it to me. I will when I find it, or um, you can send it to Jack, but I'll well, try to forward it. You probably better at I'm All right. forwarding it to this community. Yeah. I should have thought about forwarding it to the whole board, but, mm -hmm. but uh, I wanted you to see it because you're on this committee. Yeah, no, I'll try to forward it. If I can, I'll circle back to this. Committee. Committee. I'll, uh, I'll make that out of that. Yeah, I just uh, I saw it this morning. I didn't quite have enough time to make a few other things that I was still reading. <laughs> but it's a it's a powerful story. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm on slide 16. Okay. So um, documented inreach contact. You can see that we're leading the state there uh, with partners at 99% of our target. With uh, housing status 90 days after housing slot issued, we are leaving the state by ourselves. Uh, you can see that there are only two LME MCOs that are actually exceeding what the target is. It is uh, interesting. I pay a little more attention to partners these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, those are the two I would <laughs> <clears throat> well, I, These are people's lives we're talking about, so we need to make is. sure that that's the property. So. Um, and I will say, and um, I think my colleague will her over there, that um, there are some folks, some LME MCOs in the state that are doing uh, things uh, better than others. Um, but as a whole, if you look at the big picture across the TCLI spectrum, I think that we are leading the state in those efforts. And, and that, that makes it a lot easier for me <laughs> and the people who are benefiting from the services. So good. And, and hopefully, you know, that these, you know, being all public companies, are not so much in competition as finding solutions and sharing them and thinking about, okay, this is what we need to do, then let's take this statewide instead of just each of being in our little cocoons. Yeah. So on slide 18, Individuals who agreed in the transition, uh, you can see that of the individuals we talked to, 58%. Um, so we're sort of in the middle there. Sand Hills and Parkers are having better success with that. We're, we're quite a bit above uh, drilling the lines. Uh, NRH contacts resulted in a decision. Um, this is the slide I was talking about earlier. Uh, you can see it's we're at three and a half percent, and some people are as high as almost uh, 15 percent, but then there are folks below two percent as well. And is that changing the? Uh, well, well I have to look. There's no targets. You <coughs> know what you're looking for. I have to look back. Um, yeah, I believe when we first started <laughs> this uh, in uh, the first month of the year, I think we were around one percent. So, you know, it's still not where we would like it to be, but, you know, we've gone from 1% to 3.5%. Is that 3.5% of what? Of the contacts made? It's, or? it's uh, of the contacts made. Each month we um, roughly are doing about 750, 775 contacts. So it was three and a half percent of that that have actually said, yes, so I'm, I'm interested. Is that 750 unique people, yeah. or mm -hmm. every month you need, yep. or are you going back to the, some of the same ones? Well, we'll go back to the same people, but it's, it's about that many people. They change that, months. Right. It's about that many people that, that they see each month, and so about three and a half percent of those people say, yes, I'm interested in transitioning. 750 is a lot. Could you? Yep. Uh, Find that risk calculation again. Does that include prisons? Is that people at risk for um, institutionalization? Folks may be in prison, but it is for individuals with SMI and SPMI <laughs> who um, uh, are either in an adult care home or at risk of going into an adult care home. What's the definition of at risk of going into an adult care home? <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder. Um, the rough definition is that they have received a, a pass R. Um, saying that they want to enter an adult care home. 
there are also some additional um, uh, individuals in um, state hospitals who may have come into the hospital uh, and were homeless and they have nowhere to discharge. And so those people wouldn't necessarily need to pass on, but they're at risk of going into the health care homes if they don't have anywhere else to go. Yeah, after I went through this first packet, I thought, well, oh, this means it's going to be a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very good. You say that every time. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 sorry. <laughs> okay, so slide 20 is the quality of life surveys administered all the time. And uh, as we talked about before, we're up at 80% now and uh, currently third in the state. Uh, but we've come a long way. Remember way back when we first started doing this, uh, this fiscal year, we were about 40%. Yeah, it was bad. And so, you know, when you're 40%, you've got to do a lot more just to make up that percentage. So, I'm pretty pleased with that. Well, good. Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. Are you next then? Or Andrea, which one is going to do the core performance measures and compliance logs? She starts off of it and then she finishes. All right. <laughs> How's that? We share this report. I share, at least I should say, a little portion. <laughs> um, so and that's this one here, right? Yes. Pat, it's this one here. Yeah. I thought I had all run in one. Well, I was looking at this the other night in the bed with a three year old granddaughter, and I can get them back in the right order. But I'll be in the <laughs> As with the TCLI, this is the April data that we're looking at here. Um, so I'm looking at slide three. This is a review of the standards that we are and have been meeting for some time for at least the last six months, if not more. Um, that's updated for the April data, so you can see where we're at on our scores there, but we're meeting all of those still. But didn't is that uh, I thought we, our average time for answering was less than eight seconds. Is that going up? It's it's been at eight seconds average for for quite a while. Okay, okay. Right. Yeah, and we'll see that data here in a minute. So we had that down to six percent. Okay, I thought there was. Then a... we we restructure and there's a lot of staff that now work remotely and there's a little bit of a a couple of second delay when it rolls over to their line. To their line. Okay. okay. Good. Thanks. Those. Um, then with the super measure slides here, um, so, slide five is just that reminder of the, the uh, benchmarks that have been set. That's the same slide we've had for a little while here. Um, are there any questions about those benchmarks? Remember well, that penalty starts in July? That's correct. I mean, that was right when they were supposed to do this? We're, we're hashing out a lot of those details. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. And then just, okay, go on. Yeah. Um, on slide six, that's the integrated care super measure there. Um, you'll see where it's updated now as the October data. Um, we're still working on the educational materials, so hopefully those will get finished up soon and we can get those out. Um, and we still buy a rank highest among all the MCOs for the four months that you see there. So there is a delay in getting the data, but we're looking good in the data that we've got right now. Um, on slide seven, as we already mentioned, we've already hit the, the big goal uh, for the TCLI measure. Um, they, they've done some amazing things in that department. They do have an, a new internal reporting system that's actually saving a lot of administrative time right now and reducing error. And uh, they're also working on some internal dashboards that should help to um, streamline some processes and to keep us more up to date. Uh, they actually enter data in um, at least four systems, so this should hopefully streamline everything for them. And I guess we keep pushing on those housing numbers. It doesn't hurt if we go <laughs> higher and if we can get those people placed. Yeah, and they're, yeah. they're working on some really good efforts on that. Um, as you heard with the in-reach contacts, um, you kind of revisit the ones, so they're trying to come up with new options now because the pool is getting a little bit more shallow, So, but they're working really hard on that. Slide 8 is our follow-up after discharge. Um, 
So they're continuing to work on those claims and encounters issues. I think they have a lot of that cleared up at this point, but we're waiting for everything to actually move through the system to be sure of that. Uh, they, they still have the peer bridger service that they're working on, and they're refining some of the details on that and the reporting on that. Um, the internal DMA-specific report is complete, and they've submitted the enhancement to DMA and VMH, uh, so they're still waiting on that piece. We've got that updated at the bottom there uh, for October, the NC tracks data, but we don't have the internal data on that one yet. So we're still waiting on that. Now, two questions. Why, why is there such a discrepancy? And secondly, aren't we faster than NC tracks? Why, why is in-house not complete than NC tracks? Because I, I can't see holding NC tracks up as a standard. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, but that's part of what we're doing is trying to clean up a lot of with those that encounters data that we're talking about. A lot of those systems we're trying to um, actually get the data to be as accurate as it can be before we report on it. So they've done so much work on that that I think that's what's delaying it mainly. Marvin, do you have any other information on that? So these numbers are getting close. Should be getting closer together. The internal and NC tracks. That's what we're shooting for. <laughs> but but we can. Go back and appeal those numbers, or correct them, or whatnot, if we submit our internal data? No. 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 Okay. I don't want to give you an answer without being able to say myself for sure. Um, I'd be happy to get an answer back to you, though. Well, well I think this is something that's been ongoing. It's so far off. Yeah. And, yeah. And this is a super measure. And I mean, it seems pretty critical that we were able to agree with the state on what actual data. I will make sure that we get something back to you. Uh, I, I need to find out for sure where we're at exactly in that process. That'd be all right. Yvonne, yeah. well, you don't know anything about that data. You don't know why you want that data. Uh, I certainly cannot speak to DMA. In regards to DMA, I'm a little surprised that there is still some discrepancy. I thought they were a little closer. Um, because they've done a lot of work. And trying to match them up. That's why I'm kind of making myself live here to see if this is what's going to it's, it's consistent amongst the other elements. Yeah, so that would tell me it's a some system problem rather than inconsistency rather than just a fluke here or right. so us right. trying to put out false data. There's quite a few contacts so that, that are made after follow up after discharge that are unbelievable. And if they're not billable, they never get either one of these systems. And so we're trying to figure out. But is NC Tracks keeping those even if they're not billable? You can't bill them. So you never, send, you never submit the claim. Um, but we pick it up internally. It's usually paid for with non UCR dollars. So it's, it's um, mm -hmm. we see that a lot in the pricing services where they, we may have even a lot of peer support. Right. You, it, it's just not in the plan, you can't bill it. So, you know, we may make contact and follow up after discharge, but never actually get the, get the credit. And there's some, some ways that, like, for instance, ACT Team and ACT is built in some MCOs in the state where an ACT Team member may follow up because they've met their, already build their contacts that they need to, they can't, you know, they, you know, they may not build it again. Um, so there's a lot of barriers to, to the MCOs and trying to make sure this data is correct and they're getting all the credit they should get for um, for these contacts. So it's it's well, a work in progress. I don't know how I don't know why in the world the state can start penalizing them already when they don't even <laughs> yeah, well, they're, they're, when they haven't figured you know, that out yet. It's no. like NC Pass that rolled out a system that was not ever tested. And, and it's fixing to go to DSS, and right. you know, we've gone from top 10% to the bottom 25% in the last four years. We may hire a, a clinician, and it may take us four or five months to get them credentialed through NZ Tracks, and in the meantime, their building is stacking up. Mm -hmm. Nobody's getting credit for the contact. Right. So, so, well, we just like to uh, pass on to the state. <laughs> we like NC Tracks a little clean, a more cleaned up. <laughs> yeah. She's yeah. how's that <laughs> <laughs> but I, I complain every chance I get about it. <laughs> yeah. For everybody, I complain about it. Well, good. Well, I mean, if we start getting penalized, then this is, this is you know, it could happen in That's July scary. because we've got these no discrepancy of numbers from internal and that. 
Good. That's pretty important to figure out. So. Sure is. All right. Who's where are we? And we're up to <coughs> Andrea's piece. Yeah. Um, so the next section is the compliance log. And most of this should seem fairly familiar. We've added a couple of items on um, for this report. The first one is our CW episode completion records for substance use. It's, uh, we've actually gone back up. They've been working with our um, IT department to try to resolve some issues that they had. So it looks like that's improving. That is. That took a while, too, because that's been going on for a couple yeah. years. I mean, that we've. Uh... Well, we went up and we were doing well, and okay. then there was a bit of a slump for about six months, and then, but they've been, there was a report that wasn't functioning correctly, and so they've identified the error, and they're working to improve it, and I think that's really what's showing okay. here is that that's been fixed. Good, thanks. Uh, the next one we, is the uh, TBI report. This was, it, the standard is that we submit it within a, spec a specified time frame, and it was submitted late. So uh, right now I have my staff working with these individuals to find out why and what we're going to do to improve to ensure this doesn't occur again. And that's the same for the next one. We, uh, we fell a little below on CDW discharges. Um, and we're working with that department to find out exactly why this dropped because we haven't had an issue with this one before. Yeah, I, I have to say yeah. it was like 89%, so it was only a percentage point off, but we still want to find out why we, we weren't at 100%. Uh, the so for the next one, NC SNAP, we also fell slightly <coughs> below in uh, this one as well. And again, we're looking, working with departments to find out why and what we're going to do to improve. So those are, those are our new ones. The next one is incidents submitted timely. We've actually met the standard for the last three quarters, which will allow us to pull this, this particular item off the log. So, yay. Um, yeah, congratulations. And the next slide is just a little update about where we are with our external quality review and our accreditation. So, we have submitted the desk review items for um, EQR. Well, we just submitted the file request on Friday of last week, so on the 22nd. And currently, we're waiting for the on-site, which is set for September 19th and 20th. Your active desk review was submitted complete. It's 100%. And so we are currently waiting for our on-site, which will be the 24th and 25th of next month. And that is what we're working on. Mm -hmm. to back up to the page 14. Sure. the second which means after that would be correct. Yeah, so we're six, only six months out on this data? We are. It, it, there's a, it's the way it's reported. Um, it used to be a little more timely, but I, they, they switched the time frame from reporting. Um, and so that's why the information, okay. I don't know why do it changed to that. Do you have a sense of whether this is a continuing trend? I think so. They really have done a lot of outreach with providers to try to, to get these submitted as they should be. If we see it drop, It'll be brought right back on. So. Well, I should be. I would at least know. I know. And, and I could probably get it maybe a little soon. I would have to ask. Um, Lynn English is the one that's responsible for the innovations data, so I would have to ask her if possibly I could get a little peek into what's happening or what's been submitted. But usually, they, like I said, they shifted the timeline for when they submit that report, and so that's why I'm getting it later than normal. Correlations like you know, people commit suicide by taking a little bit of time off. It's like jumping off a building and waiting about a week before you get it. Well, <laughs> we used to get it about, I think, yeah, we used to get it maybe a month or two after the end of the quarter. So, you know, but like I said, they shifted. Yeah. But I'll find out if we can get maybe some earlier data in regards to that. You, you, make, you make a change and then you just say, hmm. Yeah, it looks like it's working, but I don't know what it's doing. Right. Yeah. We'll get some follow-up on that. Is that internal, or um, are we waiting for the filing from others? From we else? submit it internally to the state. Okay. And so I, I... So you do get that. You don't get it as a delay when it comes back from the state. Not that much, but mainly it's just... What I report to you is the data that we're reporting out. Because some of it, we had to wait three months to sit to yeah. get accurate. Yeah. But this, you're saying, has moved to more I like six months. When it's based on claims, yeah. they wait for them to mature. 
So I'll look, I mean, some of the innovations are, and it's a report that goes out, and I'll, I'll, but I'll talk to Lynn and see if there's any way we can get some more current data on this. And let's see, I think we're down to our last slide. We've done, the team has been working diligently on um, doing internal audits for the organization. And these are some that we wrapped up for the uh, fiscal year. And our next report will kind of show where we're moving forward into next year's auditing. And we'll also, you'll see it briefly inside the compliance plan as we put that in there as well. And this audit is a financial audit? Which or is it on the provider network? Work. It's actually an audit around the registry of unmet needs, how people get on the, the run and um, and when they come off and, and um, so have the selection. We just want to make sure that the process is flowing as it should. Okay. So you're talking about the audit being a, a reviewing the process. It is multifaceted. I couldn't, okay. um, <laughs> Annette has been leading the charge on that and okay. she is, it is really, it became a bit of a beast. Uh, more so than we thought, there's a lot of elements to this particular audit that we weren't um, planning. Are you talking about the registry limit needs? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I would characterize this, and this is how I characterize it with CLT. This is a baseline audit where we're just trying to determine. We've never audited it before, and we've inherited registries, waiting lists from ultimately seven different MCOs. And Jesse Smathers has done just an incredible amount of work to try and get the waiting list organized, make sure it's accurate when you're inheriting all those lists. Um, and so we're really just trying to do a baseline audit that then we can use in future years. Take that as our baseline. Yeah. Thanks. And if, that's, if anybody doesn't have any questions, that's it from a portion of the from staff. Yeah. Thanks. Yep, turn it over. Okay, on the core performance measures, if you'll notice on slide 18, something we're trying is to add a little bit of coding to um, the first half of the slides to make it a little easier to tell um, how that particular measure is performing. So you'll see the key there on page 18, and I'll, I'll highlight it for you on the slides as we go through. Slide 19, we have that receiving, uh, percent receiving Medicaid services, and again, this is for the April data. Uh, you'll remember that those last three months there are not matured numbers, um, but not including those, this number over that period is almost flat, almost exactly flat. Um, and estimating based on an average after full maturity, the, the April number to come up from 8.6% to around 10.7%. So again, staying near that flat trend. On the next slide on 20, you'll see the uh, non-Medicaid. Um, I'm sorry, I meant to highlight on that the uh, little graphics there. So that's a positive trend since it is flat. The second one shows that we would like a higher number on this particular one. And under control limit system, that means we, we have a watch on that little 8.6% to make sure it comes back up, um, but it's not of anything of any particular concern. On slide 20, uh, we did add a couple things to this one, or add something in particular. If you'll see that little dotted line, um, that's actually during the fiscal year, or when the fiscal year changes, the denominator on this uh, changes. And so we put that line in there so, so it made a little more sense that there was the, the jump right there um, in July. Uh, so the percentages were very similar, but because the denominator changed, that's what, what changed the graphic on that one. Overall, the two-year trend is moving upward uh, at a pretty steady pace. Um, and estimated again for April based on about an 18% average increase for this to come up to about 3.9 percent. Sure. The denominator is the Jordan Bank State. Yes, they set that for the whole year. Is the number is it based on? Is it the actual population or, uh, for for our catchment area, or is it because the percent non Medicaid services? So is this the population minus the Medicaid eligibles? You know, I would actually have to check back in. Oh, is that yes? yes okay. <laughs> So our population is declining. 
Okay. Yes, it was a smaller number. Yes, it was a smaller number for this year. And we're not far off of getting the new one, so. We'll have to see what the new one is that they'll give us soon. And again, that one is a, a positive trend. We are it, we are looking for a higher number, and it's not hitting any of our uh, concerns right now. Um, slide 21, the mental health inpatient admissions, that jagged line makes it hard to see, but it is an overall decrease for the, for the period, not including the um, not mature data there. So it is considered a positive trend. Based on estimates, again, we expect that 219 to come down to around 203, um, averaging around 188 for the month. So, and again, we're watching that number to make sure that it comes back down as expected. Because, yeah, that's, that's the highest it's been yet. Right. Right. And there, well, we've had the, two, the 223 in March in the 222 back in May of last year, but again, as it matures in general, that would come... Um, comes down a bit, about 7.5%. Okay. So it's expected it would come down a bit. On slide 22, the mental health inpatient readmissions, um, that, again, non-mature data shows us at 31 there. Overall, this is a flat trend on this whole number during this period, not including the um, unmature data. And we expect that when in general these go up about 5%, so that probably will go up a little bit, um, estimated around 33. So that may change our trend from flat a little bit, but not very far off. And that is one that we prefer the lower number on, so we're monitoring that. Um, slide 23 with the SUD inpatient admissions. These have steadily been going down. Um, for some time now. And on that one, um, usually about a 45% increase on that. So we expect that to come back to up, up around 16, which brings that closer to flat, but still a decrease from uh, where we were about a year ago. On the SUD inpatient readmissions, we just like to remind everyone that these are really small numbers, so every change looks like a big jump on there. It was at 2 for uh, April. Um, again, there is a slight increase overall on these numbers, but they're such small numbers that that doesn't amount to more than one or two people. And based on estimates, it should come in at around three um, as it matures. On mental health and patient admissions, um, we were at 90 there, which is, I know we had that little jump back in January. Um, on this one we have, there is an increased trend, so it is one uh, that we're paying attention to here. <laughs> there's usually an average of 89 after maturity, there's about a 23% drop as these mature, so that actually should hopefully come down to around 69 or 70 as it matures. But that 129 is mature. That one is, that, that one was a, a bit of an anomaly, but since then, it has uh, come back down, so. And with that, I know that's January. I, I think we do see kind of a spike around the holidays sometimes. Okay. Right. Right. Um, and again, if that one starts to follow the trend that it's been on, it'll, it will be much flatter as those three numbers mature there. So it'll even, it should even out if it follows the trend. Uh, slide 26 on the mental health inpatient readmissions. Um, on that one, we're actually seeing there is a slight increase over the period. You can't tell it from that interesting line. Uh, there's, it's usually an average of 12 after maturity. It usually goes down by about 2.5%. Um, so that number probably won't change, it's so small anyway. Um, so hopefully we're going to stay with that decline there and that's a pretty big improvement from that 17 back in January. And the way that, uh, 
No, but there is a team that is looking at the admissions and readmissions. It's a multidisciplinary team, so they are kind of diving into that issue. Yeah, because that's something we've been working on too. So. Right. Thanks. Right. Uh, slide seven, uh, 27, the SUD inpatient admissions. Um, on that one, that does appear to be trending um, a bit of a decline. Again, though you can't tell with that line if you don't consider the unmatured data. Uh, that 24 there on this number, there's usually about a 5% increase, and so that won't change much, probably around 25. Um, so this one is uh, flattening out a bit, but it is still a slight decline over the period. On the you yes. don't have a total number for that, do you? Um, I guess that's the additions, not the read, which is okay. Okay. On the readmissions, the next one, again, very small numbers in most cases, um, so any change makes a big change in the graph. On that one, it, it is a decline, despite that nine back there in the fall. Um, not, it's not a huge change, so that number might go up to three as it matures, same thing with March, uh, but it looks like those numbers are staying pretty low. On the care coordination, we had added this one uh, because they had had a little bit of a drop around the end of the year. Um, those numbers have been up for three months now. They were at 100% for the month on that number and exceeding the, the uh, standard of 80% set by the state. And is that a new program or that's one we've been doing? It's been around, it was so consistent before that that they don't usually show up in the reports because they have been meeting the standard for some time. They did, they did some systems changes around that time, which is what allowed it to drop down, but they've since uh, reworked that and have been able to get the numbers back up. Yeah. Sure. Slide 30, the ED admits there, there was a little bit of a jump um, on the January um, number. Um, because remember, we do have the offset on this one with, with the three month lag. It's almost, it's a very slight decline over actually the two year period. Um, and one of the things that I did this month that I actually looked at is there's a repeated pattern um, based on what we see here. And you don't really see it unless you look at the longer period. Um, I can't show it very well from here. But if you look at the pattern, it's pretty standard for where we're at. So yeah, January, is this. right, it, it tends it tends to be something that just is how it happens in January. So we expect that to level back out. And again, that is one that is being addressed with a multidisciplinary team. So that's a seasonal uh, pattern you're it, seeing? It appears to be. Slide 31 percent of ED admits, which which were readmissions, we were at 46 for January. Um, the the trend on this one it is showing a slight increase. It's a little bit more well, slight increase for two years. It's a little bit more pronounced for the 2017-2018 year, and that is one of the issues again that they're working on to try and address why that number is changing. January 2017, they were being 46. Oh, I see, but it's, it's actually percentages. So denominated keeps showing. Right, right. Yeah, never mind. Okay. Um, on slide 32, the total number of authorization requests received on both of these, um, there is a slight decrease in, decrease in authorizations between April of 2017 and 2018. We usually average uh, for Medicaid around 2870, so we're pretty close to that for the April number there at 2959. For non-Medicaid, we're usually around 696, so that is a little bit lower. Um, I did actually follow up and ask about that one. Um, and based on some changes, there's a system-wide shift of state-funded IED, ADVP, day support and residential, um, over to Medicaid B-funded long-term community support. Um, there were also um, some changes in the IED periodic SARS 
Um, and then the three-way contract funding for some inpatient hospitals has run out for the year. So um, all of that kind of combined for that lower 454 on the non-Medicaid number there. But that's people that are not getting served or? Some of the, a little bit of it is, but a lot of it is the change in how things were built and, and where they were built to. So there were several different factors there. Um, and then again, as the, the fiscal year starts, that should change as well. On slide 33, the total number of clean claims received. Um, on that one, um, a slight increase for Medicaid. Um, and then non-Medicaid, as is, is you can see, is pretty flat on that one. So not, not many changes there. Slide 34, again, this one came into the report because they had dropped down on that non-Medicaid number at the bottom. Um, they've since had February, March, and April at 100% on that. And um, the Medicaid number has always been uh, well above the standard. That's what we want to see. That's right. We did get the monthly MCL monthly comparison reports in um, for the March data. That's the newest one that they've provided with us so far for us so far. I did change the way that these are drawn. Um, instead of the state average being one of the bars, you'll see now that it's the red line that allows us to see who's above and who's below the state standard. So again, you, this was asked about earlier, average speed to answer calls, you'll see the average is at eight right now, and you can see the other MCOs there. Um, as Andrea said, there are some limitations involved with uh, the rollover that happens with staff that are working from home. And but will, will, they, will they be, will you be able to put note that or whatever? I mean, I know we looked before at this time, and there were some drop calls that we found were just bad calls that were being robocalls calls or whatever that were coming through. So that, that helped. That took that. It did. Yeah. And, and that's also noted, too, in the percent of calls abandoned. Um, you'll notice we're higher on that one. And I spoke to Carla, and she mentioned that there are several things that we're having with 211 is one of the issues on that one. Numbers that are coming through from that that can look like drop call, dropped calls or abandoned calls. Um, and the other one that we had was, oh, the, the um, MyCare kiosk. If somebody at the kiosk picks up and, but then hangs up, it can look like an abandoned call. So there's, there can be a bit of a false elevation on that number. And we've got like 23 of those out. And right, and right. So you know, if somebody just picks up and, and hangs it up, it still shows. And they're trying to work on how to resolve that. Yeah, because they're point. in public places and they're not monitored. That's I'm right. Just, uh, it could be a kid. I mean, it could be anybody that's doing it. Yes. There. Two one one is showing. Oh, I don't know about two one one, but I don't know the kiosk is doing the kiosk. Yeah. So, so it does artificially make it look as if our abandonment rate is, is that much higher, but um, in reality, there are some false ones in there that they're trying to fix. So, but let me get my head around this there. there you're saying that the calls are not coming into our call center or they're being forwarded before they're answered? So if, if it rings through and gets to them and they immediately hang up, though, after it's already run through to the system, it well, looks... Well, that counts as a bad call. Right. I'm, I'm to the speed of answering oh, gotcha. calls. <clears throat> and uh, just wondering, you said that they're transferring it. I did you say they're transferring it to another person? Um, well, <clears throat> for staff who work off-site, I mean, it, it, it switches over to their the phone that they have there. So, so but it's, a bit of a couple seconds. So away. that's during the answer time, not during the handoff to a, a, another person. No, time. not during handoff. So we've got some people that are remote doing calls <coughs> and their answers. I believe yes, we did. Yes. yes. So it's similar to if you're, you know, if you're part one of those people still have calls. If you forward your home phone call to your cell phone, uh, the person on the other end, <coughs> right, right. Well, I, I was just curious because I, I just thought all our call center people were here, but they're not. So. Especially the overnights. 
Um, okay. Yeah, okay. a lot of the overnight okay. people were from home. Okay. Right, and so that's what she said is that, right. There's an extra second in the delay as it rolls to their. Now the standard is, is 30 seconds, so we're well below. Yeah, we're right. I know, but, but we were. But yeah, we're we, top of the. <laughs> well, we had all the staff. <laughs> I don't want to slide. Competitive, are you? We're competitive. <laughs> but yes, I mean, technically, they're still probably answering within that six seconds that we had met. But because there's that slight one or two right. second delay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, slide 37 percent of enrollees receiving Medicaid, um, MHD, SD services. Um, we are second on that one and a good bit above the state average there at 7.1%. And that's, a, a, that's a, a something to be proud of. Yes. That's our highest penetration, next second highest penetration rate. That's definitely something to be proud of. On the non-Medicaid there, we are actually at the highest percentage at 3.4% and above the state average of 2.5%. That's something we need. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, that's, that's not the bill that's, that's having to come out of other funds, yes. That's right. Rate of enrollees receiving Medicaid services, um, again, we are the second highest at 86 and again, well above the state average of 71. And the same number for non-Medicaid and still at the highest rate at 34, well above the 25 state average. Slide 41 for the rate of mental health admissions. Uh, we did have the highest for the, the month at 1.40, uh, well above the next at 1.31, and well above the state average of 1.03. Well, that's when we were Right, that's one that we're working on. The readmits, we were actually uh, fourth on that one, so in the middle of the pack, we were still above the state average of 11% at 12.6%. Um, again, focusing on that number with that team that's working on it. The uh, rate of SUD admissions was quite low at 0.03, so well below um, the state average of 0.05 on that one. And I guess it's small numbers? Yes. And if you look down at the bottom, underneath where it says VIA, you can see ours, our uh, SUD admission was, or rate, our number was five. And um, Yvonne, just to um, put a bug in, in your ear, um, as far as the state uh, uh, Using percentages off of small numbers, that can be a problem. Uh, they set new standards for the DSS stuff, and in our small county with four people, the percentage of meeting 95% when you only have five, four or five clients, if one gets out of compliance, then you, the whole thing's out of compliance too. So I just, I just wanted to realize that what works in Charlotte doesn't work in the smaller rural counties as well by a straight percentage. So. If you can pass that on to me. <laughs> I have a question. These are uh, by county of residence or by where I would have to check for you. Yeah, I would have to check to be sure on that. I don't want to answer incorrectly on that for you. Because it might be the who has the most personal greater. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, slide 44 readmits is percent of admits for SUD. Um, very similar to what was just said, we were at 20% and that amounted to one person. Um, so. <laughs> right. Like I said, it, it doesn't really always work for percentages in London. Slide 45 with our non Medicaid rate of mental health admissions per 1,000, we were below the state average. Uh, we were at 0.80. Um, and. So what's wrong with partners? Yeah. 
But Jack, you're saying it, it could be a factor to the number of beds available too in an area catchment area. I think we're setting the emergency room ready to be placed. If there's a bed available, then they, they get a number. If there's not a bed available, they're there for three days, four days. Sometimes there's situations that change. Yeah. You know, so so availability does affect some of the Oh, absolutely. It's not at all uncommon for people to go to the ED under an IGC and uh, the bed opens up or just then they're reevaluated after 24 or 48 hours and the doctor says they no longer meet IVC criteria or I'm not sure they ever met IVC criteria. Yeah, so uh, I can see availability of beds affecting how these numbers come up. So is there um, any way we could get uh, a number on the beds available here? I mean, is that something that we track to? Thursday by day. Mm -hmm. I guess so, yeah, who's in and out? Okay. I guess so, we all have to his number. Well, we'd have to look at <coughs> geographically nearby beds for each of the availability, too. That, that's a whole other thing. But it is a factor. That, I mean, if you're looking at these, you've got to look at what could be affected. So. On slide, 46 readmits as percent of admits for mental health, non-Medicaid. Um, we were tied at the top there at 11%. Um, again, it's interesting where the, the percentages play out because we had 10 and partners had 27, but our percentage was the same. So based on that jump that they had on that other chart. And what are we doing on that? On the admissions, that that is the team that we have looking at all of the admissions and readmissions. Does that change? Oh, okay, I should be able to see your data. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been up for a little. We get spiked and then we yeah, it was 18 on September. So. Okay. Rate of STD admissions per 1,000 on Medicaid. Um, we were just <coughs> early above the state average on that at 0.16, right in the middle of the pack. And usually that would be the opposite of the Medicaid, wouldn't it? Um, I guess we're not basing on funding on the pay, we the pay on that. Right. The mission pay. Um, the readmits as percent of admits on that one for SUD, um, we were at 11 percent, but again, that amounted to two people. So it was the highest rate, but two people. Um, rate of ED admits per 1,000, again, with the lag on that one, we were below the state average, um, and third on that one at 1.80. And that's been going down in first. Four months too. It has. Five or six months. Yeah. That's the lowest we've had in quite some time. Um, and then ED readmits as percent of total admits. We were again below the state average at 16%. Third on that one. A little higher than last month, but fairly stable. Yeah, it kind of jumps around that 16%, 19, 17, 15, yeah. yeah. Percent of Medicaid authorization requests denied um, on this one. Uh, we were below the state average by a good bit. We were at 2.3%. Um, and third from the bottom on that one. Or second from the bottom, sorry. The rate of cons uh, Medicaid consumer authorization appeals. Um, Again, well below the state average, we were at one on that. A little higher than the last couple months, but barely. <coughs> Medicaid consumer authorization appeals as percent of denied authorizations. We were second on that one at 21.5%. Um, a little bit higher than the last couple of months. Any other one? 
just going up for the last uh, been going up for three months. It has been going up. I don't I don't know, but I'd be happy to check on why that one's going up. That's not the direction I want that trend to go. For the non-Medicaid on that, um, we were at 1%, right at the state average there. And that one stays pretty low as a general rule. Rate of non-Medicaid consumer authorizations, we did not have any for the month of March. Also for non-Medicaid consumer authorizations and appeals, because of that, we were, again, also at zero. Um, average number of days for processing Medicaid claims, four of us at nine days, so that's a pretty standard number there, um, similar to what we've been at for the last year. We've gone down a little bit, but we might be on Yeah. There was some discussion about whether it's got to do with the systems we're on, since those they're on alpha as well at the nine days. But that's not a super measure there. No. Mm -hmm. um, and then the non-Medicaid average number of days, we were at 8.5 on that one, just barely above the state average. Uh, Are either of those due to um, Unfilled positions in the organization? Not that I'm aware of. That's pretty good. Um, this number, uh, non Medicaid percent of claims, dollar value denied by need of service. Um, we were just above the state average at 4.1%. Um, we're working on some reports to capture the Medicaid side of this, but that hasn't been completed yet. This is only the non-Medicaid. Um, Grade of Medicaid grievances per 1,000 at 1 1.9. We were just slightly above that state average. Um, number two on that one. How much of those grievances are um, On that month, let's see if I capture all of those. She breaks them down for me, but. That did go up from December to January and November. She broke it down for me, but I don't have it right on hand. I'd be happy to make sure that I bring that each month so that you'll know what the, what those are actually amounting to. And on the non-Medicaid grievances, that last slide there, um, we were at 1.08, just barely above the, the, the uh, state average there, and third about that rate. But it's only five people, so. Right. Right, that's always a pretty small number for us. Were there any questions about any other questions about any of that? No, that's good. It's, uh, I guess, some, uh, some up and some down. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think the up's a little better than the down. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Number five successes and achievements. Can't you send us out? <laughs> Why do we need, we need to add some? <laughs> All right. Um, so we're done with that. On to Tracy, huh? All right. This should be hopefully quick and painless. We're going to go through our annual compliance program plan, which is a, one of our federal requirements. It's a requirement um, of our year accreditation body. First, I want to uh, give credit to one of our new staff members, and that before. She was sitting there next to Andrea, and uh, I'm very excited. I was able to delegate this and not have to do it myself. <laughs> uh, so Annette did a lot of the work, took the plan from last year, and really um, spent some time to go through it, make sure it was updated in compliance with any changes in the, in the federal regulations. 
and then our, our communication staff made it look beautiful, so that was nice. Um, you know, it, it's a pretty standard document um, it's, you know, that we're required to have. The sections are, are pretty clear. Um, you know, section one really describes why we have this document and what, what the purpose of it, of it is and what it does. Um, section two kind of outlines the different components, um, required components of a compliance program plan. Um, the first of which is, you know, written standards of conduct, written policies. Um, and, and we use, of course, policy tech, um, which is an electronic policy system for that. Um, compliance program administration, which is the requirement that I help have a compliance officer, which is me, um, and our regulatory compliance committee, and then by health, and then of course this committee. Um, the next section covers our screening of employees and vendors. Um, in terms of prohibited affiliations, whether they're on the exclusion list, criminal background checks, licensure checks, and all of that is done both on the provider side through our credentialing team and for our staff by human resources. The next section covers education and training, which is another required component. Most of our compliance training um, occurs two ways. Um, all employees receive compliance training as part of new employee orientation, and then we do an annual compliance week event which has surprisingly become more popular than you would have thought. And um, that is because we discovered the secret that if you give people uh, a cup or <laughs> a sticky pad with the Buy Health logo on it, that they get excited about it. So we've, we've tried to make sure that um, we do some of them. We, we, <laughs> we, we, we try to have music. We try to make it fun. And what we've done is we've also combined it with our leadership training, um, our HR training um, for um, our managers and supervisors. And so Patrick McCoy, who you all met um, at the last meeting, our new HR director is going to be very involved with us in developing Compliance Week this year. So I've got a little question from the previous uh, Section 5. It probably sure. doesn't have anything to do, but fingerprint shall be required if the applicant is less than five years residency in North Carolina? That is a, um, it's a statute. So, so if you've been here more than five years, you don't have to have your fingerprints taken? That is correct. You have to do background checks. You have to do background checks. Yeah. I'm just curious. Sorry. I, I, I digress. It's a statutory requirement? Yeah. And, um, yeah. and that for all of our employees. Yeah. And well, I'm, 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 it's like asking for a phone number on your check, though. <laughs> if, you know, a crook's going to write down the wrong phone number, but for some reason, you write down your phone number on the check, and they'll take it all of a sudden. So, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to do it for very many of our, of our applicants for employment, but for, for some we yeah. do. Um, it's actually done, our fingerprints are done through the SBI because we're a government agency, yeah. um, which there's been a little bit of a hiccup with that. Um, there was a change in administration at the SBI, and they um, failed to appreciate that we were a government entity, and so they stopped doing it for us, so we've had to kind of have some back and forth with them that, yes, we are government, and we still need you to do these for us. Um, after education and training, it is effective lines of communication, and this is in my mind, this is probably the most important section, the most important piece of our compliance program. This is about making sure that staff understand that there is a mechanism for reporting potential non-compliance and what that mechanism is. And of course, we follow a no wrongdoor approach, um, which is how we um, approach grievances and complaints from our members as well. There is, there is literally no wrongdoor um, for reporting because um, we want to get as many reports as possible. Um, and we do that primarily through our ethics point system, um, and the reason we like ethics point is it allows us to track um, and to do reports and we can have better data on what are the issues um, confronting the organization. Um, enforcement of standards and disciplinary guidelines, that section is really about making sure that whatever enforcement we do that we are consistent across the organization and that disciplinary guidelines are not different based on, for example, your title. Um, so that disciplinary guidelines are the same for all employees in biohealth um, and we do not retaliate. Um, internal monitoring, audits, investigation, and risk identification, that is really Marvin's, Marvin's job and you know, that's been kind of a, a fairly new um, component for us is to have dedicated staff for internal monitoring and auditing which is required by the changes to the federal regulation. Um, response and remediation, of course once you've identified a problem you've got to fix the problem, so that's the, the next component. 
Um, I include a section on privacy, security, and human rights just because I think that's such an important part of who we are and what we do. Um, and then a newer section is trying to work on sort of program monitoring and evaluation. How do we make sure that our compliance program is effective? And probably the piece I'd like to turn your attention to is on page 27, which is where annual work plan starts. Um, actually, I take that back. It's page 30. It shows the work plan. And that um, is updated pretty robustly every year because this identifies um, the actual goals for this year for our compliance program, um, a lot of which will be carried out by Marvin and his team. So the first is, you know, what are we going to do with our policies, procedures, and standards? Our goal is to continue to maintain an appropriate number of policies. We're really excited that we've gotten from over 300. We are now down to, I believe, 137, 138, um, which was a huge shift for us. We've done a lot of work over the last two years to simplify our policies, make them easier for staff to read and understand, um, eliminate duplication, because when you have duplication, you end up with inconsistent policies. So for example, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example. We used to have um, care coordination had one policy and UM had another policy around crisis services. Well, there were slight variations in that. And so we wanted, no, let's just have one policy on crisis services so that everybody is clear um, and we don't duplicate. Mm -hmm. Um, we've started to really monitor compliance with policy reading requirements. Uh, policy Tech actually tells us who has read the policies. Um, they're required to read them within 30 days of hire um, and within a certain time frame after a new policy is published. And so staff actually provide me with a report. And this year, for the first time, I started sending out little, little reminder emails. Dear so-and-so, we noticed that you have not read your policies and we need you to, to, to get to that as soon as possible. So Policy Tech really had, gives us that capability to keep track of who's reading them and who hasn't. Um, I mean, this is part of the job. It is part of the yeah. job. It's so it's not like they have to do this extra time. It's like yeah. they need to take time during the mm -hmm. job to read the policy. So. Yes. And um, so, so yeah, so we really like that about the, about the system. Um, and then obviously we have to continuously revise and update our policies as federal regulations change. Our contract with the state changes, accreditation requirements. So it's, it's, you know, it's a living, breathing process that never ends. You, know, you can't just write a policy and not come back to it for five years. Um, we have to continue. One of the requirements, I'm moving on to part two in terms of compliance program administration. Um, it's actually, I really feel like this was the lobbyist for the Healthcare Compliance Association did really good with, with Congress. They actually got written into the federal regulations that the compliance officer has to have annual training. So, um, and, and lo and behold, they put on an annual training. So, um, Marvin and I typically attend at least one annual training to kind of get up to speed on changes in federal health care um, laws impacting compliance. Um, and that's put on by the federal government? The federal government participates, but it's put on by a private okay. association called the Healthcare Compliance Association. It's a it's a good conference. It typically has um, speakers from the um, Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General um, is a keynote keynote speaker almost every year. So it's it's very well attended by government. Mm -hmm. And you get specific, accurate information. We get accurate yeah. information. We get a lot of handouts and materials. So. And changes, they let you know the changes. They exactly. Okay. And we're on listservs and other things. Yes. They also um, provide us materials, though. Uh, okay, as far as yeah. using the compliance. Yeah. Um, part three, screening of employees and vendors. We're going to continue to work with you know, our new HR director to ensure continued implementation of the personnel file audit plan of correction. That was one of the plans of correction from this last year. Um, yes? You might have gave the word new just in case. We will be collaborating with HR as they roll out potentially a new HRIS system module. We rolled out um, the payroll module within the last year, and we're looking at rolling out um, a recruitment um, application module. Um, and then um, potentially conduct a file audit to look to make sure that those background checks are happening. Um, communication, education, and training. We're still, you know, constantly working on our training materials. The challenge is keeping them interesting, keeping them relevant, 
Um, the best way that I have found to keep staff engaged in our compliance training is to have real life case examples. That's usually the most effective way for any kind of training. Um, and so I'm on a USDOJ listserv that gives me um, pretty regular updates about um, cases and um, indictments and convictions of people. So I try to look for cases that are either behavioral health uh, specific, um, specific to North Carolina, um, or a major uh, North Carolina provider, even if it's not behavioral health specific, um, managed care specific, and give them those case examples, which is, seems to be the most effective way. Um, we want to try and do more voiceover PowerPoints because then those can just be available on our internal website for staff to access whenever they need to. Um, and we do occasionally, our training is sometimes part of the disciplinary process, so we have on a couple of occasions when staff um, have had hard scene security incidents, I've required them to do remedial. They have to come to new employee orientation and go through the privacy and security training again. Um, internal audits and reporting systems, so you will see what our planned audits are for the year. It doesn't mean we might not do other audits, but these are the ones we are definitely planning. Um, we're going to do an audit of the housing team, which we've not done before, an audit of claims and encounters, an audit of our SIU and contract performance unit, and then Rhonda actually, because she's she's pretty awesome that way, requested an audit of via total care, care coordination to try and get a baseline of, of what we think of their activities. Um, we want to finalize any plans of correction that are outstanding, um, and then in terms of investigation, those come up on an as-needed basis. So we'll continue to promptly investigate when things are reported. So what we'd be asking is that um, this committee make a recommendation to the full board to approve the compliance plan with the striking of the word new. And we'll do that. This is the finished product. It would be very helpful to me if we saw what we did with all the strike throughs of the new word. I can certainly give you a you know. Sure. Um, we don't need it this time because Sure. What I can do is do a word comparison that will show you the difference between the two versions. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Annette, <coughs> we can do that, right? I'm on it. Okay. Annette says we can do that. <laughs> it's practically <laughs> done. <laughs> is make a recommendation, yes. And, um, I guess each employee signs this, reads this, and signs this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I think Rick, Rick signs it every year okay. as, the, as the board chair, um, and then it is posted on our internal SharePoint um, site for all staff. Okay. So that's not our signature. And it's the time of year for annual reports. No, we will need a motion. Um, no, no. A motion. Oh, sorry. Jack made a motion. You I'll second that. Okay. All in favor of taking this to the uh, full board. For approval, say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. So, for, for doing all your work. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, what Thanks was that? Thanks for doing all your work. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. <laughs> so, are you Stephen today? Are you the next section here? This. Oh. <laughs> is it the service? Yes, Kate. Kate is Stephen today. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. When I put so together the agenda, I didn't realize Stephen was on annual leave. <laughs> okay. okay. So, so we're back to you on the quality management annual plan. <laughs> annual report. Yeah. 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 Y
as far as the graph and dashboards and stuff. So yeah, that this, and a lot of this I was familiar with already, and then, but it was good to see the, the detail and, and uh, always good to see who the people are that are actually doing it since I don't work with them daily. Yeah, Patty Wilson, um, who you all know, did a lot of work on this with Stephen and, and his team. Um, Patty is unfortunately out on FMLA, um, so she was not able to be here either today. So we don't unfortunately have our subject matter experts necessarily here in the room, but I think between Kate and Andrea and I, we can answer any questions that you might have. I have one that it's on page three. Page <coughs> three of which document? Uh, the first, uh, the quality improvement program evaluation in 2017 okay. and there, There's a graph on that, you know, that page and the set point engagement and substance use. Uh, there's a, a Medicaid rate and there's a state federal rate. Um, and then there's a combined rate. And there's a little chunk there around February of 2017 that the combined rate is lower than either two. I thought that was really cool. I don't know how you can do that. To make your denominator grow faster. That's a good question. Either one. So maybe that that maybe that line is I don't know. It just makes me wonder about that. I'm here about that. Um that's not one I think we're gonna be able to answer here yeah, today. I didn't but think we can so. certainly find out. And we bring it to you, we have to get the board to approve um, us submitting it, but we have time. It doesn't get submitted to the state until August, so we've got a little time to make some corrections. But, so we're wanting to perhaps do some corrections today, recommend that, or y'all going to, I mean, we this is just, a draft. I mean, it's we're gonna, a draft. We would, rec we would ask that you recommend um, giving us the authority to submit, um, you know, to finalize and submit these documents to the state in August. Is that correct, Andrew? Is that what I'm saying without, correct? Without seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we would need to do, technically, we do need approval um, uh, reflected in the minutes that you've reviewed and approved with with the changes noted. So that would be how that would need to be. So we need to see the changes noted. So we'll be revisiting this in August. Well, I, really, you know, I don't know how you want to word that. Technically, we could bring it back again. So, um, I don't know how we reflect it in the minutes, though. I would love to just give them the authority to help. Well, I don't, I don't mind yes. giving them the authority. I don't have any problem with that. I was, I was a little skeptical, but I looked through it. I looked through it. I didn't approve it, but any well, changes yeah. that you know, we'll be making those changes before we actually submit it. Yeah. Okay, did you document and I'm making sure, could, could I make sure of what, because I, I was trying to get the document open quickly. It's on page three. Uh, is that second yeah. section? Yeah. yeah, it's just that the combined rate is lower than, than the rate either one of them. Yeah. It should be somewhere in between. Usually. Right, it doesn't make sense, but I thought it Which one is that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe around February of 2017. Yeah. Oh, there. Yeah. Just, it could be a, 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 and it really doesn't have anything to do with, you know, you know how trending is and what our, you know, where we're going with it or whatnot. It just might look bad. Sure. Sure. Yeah, it's not. Then it is. It's not going to Uh, it took me a while to figure out that you were presenting all that on purpose because that's where you generated the fact there was a fact. Right. And, but, and then there's the fact. So I had to stretch out. That was fine. Okay. Uh, Page 21. Um, I highlighted this uh, about the middle paragraph analysis by data stats. Um, is that another service we use? Page 21 in the middle paragraph. Um, it's about member satisfaction, so it's the ECHO survey. 
it was, uh, it seemed like the adults were different than the children. We don't administer the ECHO survey. That's actually done by um, CCME, and then they contract that. And the, the responses to that are very low. Okay. Uh, as far as the, the actual number of people that respond. Well, it was interesting on that on that survey that the kids, you know, the kids graphs were that they it made sense that they they didn't have the same questions as the adult uh, members did, yeah. and it kind of showed that the kids didn't really understand what questions to ask, whereas the adults are going to know knew which questions to ask. I guess that's what right. um, There are two graphs on page 22. Having to do with processing data. I have processing data for the agency. What page is that? 28. 28. <laughs>2015, 2018, you'll see kind of surges as you go. They've tried to kind of 
shift those a little so it's not the hit that it's always been, but there is still some of that there. Yes. So that could be some of it. That could the absolutely that be some. There's that going that works every three years. The recredentialing of, of, of providers, practitioners, and LIPs. Yeah, it concerns me because we can't get paid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. And you're and you're taking a, a chance that that person may not get credential, and then you, and you so, have all these back bills. So then, then you kind of have payments. to weigh. Well, we need to provide the service to. Let's just get them in yeah. and get the service. What I'd like to propose is um, that we have Andrew Don Frio, who is our credentialing director, come to the next. Uh, meeting in August and give you um, a short update on where he stands with improving that that number. And we'll um, get with him to maybe improve the language around that particular quality improvement activity before it's submitted to the state. And maybe a, a separate out the re-credentialing to the credentials and that might, might show a little different it's number. The same people doing it. It's the same staff doing it. Yes. But there is a little bit of a difference. If, if there isn't going through the recredentialing power process, they are getting paid, as opposed to the ones who are brand new to the UC organization. Right. That is not specific enough. We got it. Quality life surveys, and that was really good. Um, and that just knocked it out of the park at 100% for the last three months. Is so. the motion needed for the improvement class? Not yet. I'm still looking. Okay. I thought we were wrong. I apologize. No, I'm jumping around. Just looking at where I've made notes. Christian, who is pure pleasure for what is pure So, pure pleasure is. Um, Part of our overall effort to meet the follow-up after discharge supermeasure, and um, do we have, I don't have anybody from provider network here. Jeannie, can you do you have enough knowledge to talk about the peer bridger and what the peer bridger is in terms of it's it's a peer who is embedded in a hospital emergency department um, to help provide a service that would meet the follow-up after discharge criteria. Um, they connect them with them in the hospital before they're discharged so that they can connect with the services mm -hmm. um, as they leave. <laughs> are they a buy-in employee or a provider? No, they're provider. Provider network. Mm -hmm. The peers would be like our peer-to-peer -peer counseling group that have, they've, they've been, had issues or had they, they yes. experienced it themselves, yes. experience. and yes. so that then they're supposed to be able to connect better with right. people as far as here's what you need to do so we can get follow up in seven days. And, yes. and I've, I've been there, and, and let me tell you, this would help if you want to do this. Exactly. At that point. Okay. So, so that's, that's something we've been expanding as part of our supervisors' um, projects. And, that, and apparently it's about 65 to 100 percent since 20 to 30 percent, and we're above 40. But right now, we're not above 40. Huh. We are not above. Um, I, have, I have some more recent numbers, but, but again, we don't have any numbers from the state for the super measures past January or past December. All we've got is through December. Well, most of our efforts really didn't begin to take effect until January. If you look at our internal numbers, and again, these are our internal numbers, we have met the 40% oh, yeah. after discharge January, February, March, April for Medicaid um, on both mental health and substance use. On non-Medicaid, um, we don't start seeing those improvements until I think the March and April numbers. Um, but again, these are our internal numbers. Um, we don't have data yet from the state, but we are seeing definite uh, improvement and, and progress on those numbers um, as some of these efforts that we're working on have started to, to take effect. Are there any questions? And then I just wanted to compliment um, the team for uh, doing their ASQ um, qualification here. It's uh, Stephen got his uh, Manager yeah. of Quality and Operational Excellence, and the whole team are now members of ASQ. So I assume that's a professional um, credentialing that helps with our 
service? It is. Congratulations. And we attended the conference, which is... I know, that's what it said, so that's it good. It's great. And uh, we, we've all, you know, mm -hmm. like I said, got to be refreshed, and, and uh, we, uh, hopefully we're all still learning. Yep, never stop. I'm just going to submit the plan as it has been modified. No one's favor? Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. Okay, so now we've got the program description. We'll go through that like that too. I have a question about the, the difference in the, the why we need a separate quality concurrent advisory team from quality concurrent committee. It looked to me like the quality improvement advisory team for the boots on the ground thing. It's the internal staff, it's boots on the ground. Okay, yeah. and then the QI committee is the sort of overseas the functions or something? Yes. Nice. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. The subwork group is really just a small collection of people that kind of get in the weeds with the QIPs, and then they make a recommendation up to the Quality Improvement Committee. And then that, via these plans and evaluations, comes to this committee for approval. So that's not what this says. It's like it's just a flowchart group. <clears throat> Well, I, I wonder too if that's the arrows, connection. Yeah. Well, it doesn't say which way it's going. I mean, I guess going this way, but that's the connection from TLC to this board right here to the committee. And I could have sworn you all right here. We have. So, this probably this needs to be revised. Yeah, this is the first time we've seen this. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
is really bad. It's almost more than neutral and black. So you need a motion to accept this as well. Yes. And so this is just how the state divides it up into these three sections. So right. that's why we do it this way. Okay. It's not it's not our choice. This is how the state divides it. Oh good, up. okay. Well then then uh, do we have a motion to accept this? The status is based on the state's definition, not a mutual okay. Yeah. I'm gonna delete three this is circulated by the general board. Yeah, so I just want to make sure that I'm clear. Andrew, did you take notes? But what we have is that the QM evaluation is approved subject to the change on the um, substance use chart and the credentialing um, quality improvement activity. Yes. The QM description is approved subject to the change in the flow chart, mm -hmm. and the QM work plan documents are approved as presented. And was the word new in that first one? The new was in the compliance plan. I got that out too. I just wanted to make sure I had that clear for the record. Those are the changes you would like us to make. Okay, so do we have a motion? Uh, you made a motion on this. We got a second. Anybody all in favor? Say aye. Okay. Moving right along. Um, back to Kate, I guess. Is that the I don't have pre the presentation of surveys? Is this the surveys, Kate? Yes. That is me. <laughs> And these should be the, what you're looking at, right? The QIPs, correct? Presentation of sur oh, survey. No, it's, it's the survey okay. review, right? Survey's fast and correct. Yes. That's this one. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's this one, Pat. Okay. So on this you'll see on, on slide number three there, um, this actually covers four different surveys in an overview. Um, the 2017 Provider Satisfaction, the 2017 ECHO, the 2017 Perception of Care, and the 2016-17 National Core Indicators. Um, it starts with the Provider Satisfaction Survey. Um, I'm sorry, I wonder if I'm going to So this is all old, pretty old stuff. They, so they complete the survey and then um, a number of months later they send us a report. These are the state mandated surveys that we do. Right. So we haven't had the data back all that long on these. Yes. This is, yes, that's as fresh as we have. On the provider satisfaction survey, the ones that we uh, put in the presentation are ones where we actually saw some notable difference in the, the uh, responses on these. Um, you'll see on slide number five, we did have a pretty big increase on please rate your overall satisfaction with the LMEMCO at 89.6%. Uh, we actually moved from number six among the MCOs in 2016 to number two for 2017 on that. State average is 84.4%. Uh, we don't have uh, page numbers, graph numbers on our Okay, it, it says question 28 right. at the top, or Q28. I'll make sure to highlight that. On question 13, uh, provider network meetings are informative and helpful. We had a large increase in our, our uh, percentage there from 74.8 to 87.2. Um, state average was actually 87.2. And on that, we moved up one. We were at seventh in 2016 and moved up to six in 2017. For question 14, provider network keeps providers informed of changes that affect my local provider network. We did um, have a little bit of a decrease from 85.8 to 84.6%. State average was 85.6. We did move from fourth to fifth on that one. Um, question 16, our interest as a network provider are being adequately addressed in the local provider council. Uh, we did have a really nice increase there from 73.9 to 86%. We actually moved uh, from fifth in 2016 to first in 2017 on that one. So, great improvement. 
Um, question 18, the LMEMCO staff conducts fair and thorough investigations. We moved up from 89.6% to 91.5. Um, on that one, we moved from third place in 2016 to first place in 2017 as well. Question 19, after the audit or investigation, the LMEMCO requests for corrective action plans and other supporting materials are fair and reasonable. Um, a very slight increase on that one. Um, on that, we were first in 2016, and we stayed at first for 2017. Question 26, my agency is satisfied with the appeals process um, for denial reduction or suspension of services. We had a slight decrease there, but we still managed to keep our first place ranking from 2016 to 2017. Information technology trainings are informative and meet my agency's needs. We did have, have a 1% decrease there. Um, we stayed in sixth place on that one, so we got some room for growth. Question 21, trainings are informative and meet our needs as, as a provider slash agency. We had a, a big increase there from 81% to 85.4. Um, we didn't move far, but we moved from seventh place to sixth place on that one. The LMEMCO's, uh, question 27, sorry, the LMEMCO's website has been useful, has been a useful tool for helping my agency find the tools and materials needed to provide services. We kind of stayed at the same percentage there, but we moved from sixth to fifth on that question. Um, on that next uh, slide there, what you'll see is for the 2017 survey, uh, we increased in a, in a number of different questions, so we were in first place for eight questions, whereas in 2016 we were only first for three, and then in that second place category we, we moved from one to five questions, so we did have some nice growth on this survey. I have a question. How many, sure. How many providers answered this? On? Was it, was it voluntary? We had um, pretty good participation back, but it is voluntary. Um, I don't have the numbers on me on that, but I can get them for you. Is it 100, 500, 2,000? I was thinking more like 300 and something. It was, it was a solid number. It was, it was pretty good. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that's a, you said it was a majority? Of, uh, I actually have it here. Um, I don't respond to surveys since I'm pissed off about <laughs> Well, you see, I was, so really, there is a negative I was really determined to get that provider yeah. network score up, so I, I, I so probably. You pushed the survey. I so. probably stopped them to respond. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to pull, pull that up after I go through these, but I do okay. have that in another file. Okay, fine. Sure. Um, on the next survey, the Experience of Care and Health Outcomes Survey, um, on that one, the response rate is really small. Um, the sample was 571 on the adults. We only had 77 usable surveys, which is 0.3 of the adult members receiving services. So the results of the entire survey are not considered statistically significant on that. Um, for the children, the response, the useful surveys was at 99.9%, and again, that's not considered statistically um, significant. On the perception of care survey, um, we, on our demographics there, we had, that was broken down into parents, youth, um, so the, either 12 to age 12 to 17, um, parents are for children under the age of 12, and then the adult survey there. Um, so you can see the breakdown there on um, our totals, and then how it break down, broke down with male, female, and mental health and substance use. As I'm, I'm sure you can understand, the parent survey is really low on the SUD percentages there. I think they might not be answering that honestly. Well, remember that's 12 and under substance use. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. And then it, you'll see it goes up with the youth and then up again with the adults. Perception of care survey is actually administered through provider agencies who are drawn in a random sample. So yeah. they're, they're taken right there at the provider 
And is that still the one that was statistically small? Or no, this, this one has a larger, you'll see there that there were, um, it, it totals out to around 700 for the total uh, responses on that survey. Okay. Um, you will see next the county of residence. So there's a pretty big spread. Of course, some of the small counties, it's harder to get some responses back. Two highest being uh, Buncombe and Wilkes County there. And then down from that, there was uh, quite a bit with Rutherford and uh, Henderson down to Haywood. Um, uh, the largest quantity of these are usually wind up filled out at our uh, comprehensive providers, and they cover most of the counties, or well, all of the counties, but it depends on who's coming in during that one month survey period. It just goes on for a month. Right. Um, on the types of services received, uh, again, that, that chart is broken down by adult, youth, and parents. So for the adults, it's mainly the basic uh, community services and the intensive community services, also fairly high on crisis services. services. Um, youth and parent kind of stick to those basic community services. So. Duration of services. Kind of a, all over the place for those. For the adult surveys, the largest number were more than two years receiving services. For the youth, the largest number um, were the three to five months uh, time period. And then for the parents, it was at six to 11 months there. On the interference with the ability to receive services, those big sections in that kind of a light pink color, what's nice about those is that all those folks said that there was no interference. So half of them on the adults, and then the large majority of both the youth and the parents. And then the transportation is pretty, uh, it's not that big, it's only 6%. That seems to be something we've looked at before as a, a well, and, the, and it does happen, and that's probably the high percentage where you're seeing that is in the more rural areas of the ones that do say that. Uh, the so question on the youth doctor, they don't, they don't have to drive, so that's they're not right. really concerned about transportation. That's right. Um, the questions on the survey that are actually related to the uh, LVMCO, um, so questions used to resent great perception of services that we provide. The ones that are on the survey are, did you receive a consumer handbook within 14 days? Do you know how to make a complaint with VIA? If you contacted VIA to request services, were you given a choice of providers? Was your first service with your provider in a time frame that met your needs? Has VIA provided you with as much information as you need about supports and services available to you? And if you needed help applying for benefits such as Medicaid, food stamps, or disability, did you receive the assistance you needed? Um, if you look at the breakdown on those. Hang in there. We've got to wrap it up here. Sure. Um, there's a lot of not sure's there, and we've learned it's because they don't explain what an LME is. Again, thank you all for being here and the great job y'all do every day. So, thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. I guess I need a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. I'll
favor? Thank y'all.